Welcome back. We are back to section 7.1, functions of several variables. In this second video, we are going to examine functions again in the sense that we will look at their domain and we're going to look at uh, graphs and level curves. So let's get back to where we ought to be. Get back to where you once belonged, as they say. So we just did some function evaluation and now we're going to think along the same lines of what we did for functions of one variable, we're going to take a look at domain and say, uh, where might this function be defined and sort of what thought processes go into this? So it, it turns out then when we're thinking about domain of a function of two variables, the same sorts of things that come up with functions of one variable are still around. Namely, the three that I have in my head are things that can go wrong include dividing by zero. So we're gonna to try to find variables that might cause us to divide by zero and omit those from the domain. Things that make us take square roots or more broadly even roots of negative numbers, those are a problem. So we wanna make sure things under radicals are generally zero or bigger. And then the third category would be logarithms uh, because when we try to take logs of zero or negative arguments, then we end up with non-real numbers. So we're gonna to try to keep the stuff inside of logs positive as well. So uh, here, this function doesn't have a context, but it certainly is exciting. And we're going to try to find its domain, and we're going to remind ourselves just how to compute stuff anyway, because it's good to practice that. So this is sort of a broccoli first kind of situation, because the domain is a, a more challenging question than this function evaluation. We'll get to dessert afterwards. Sorry, Garfield. So we've got our function here, uh, and as, as I mentioned, there, there are a couple of things that can go wrong. So one is this uh, square root piece. So we have this square root of y that's tacked on there. Um, we're going to make sure that the stuff underneath the radical stays uh, non-negative, so zero or bigger. That's going to mean that y should be greater than or equal to zero. Second thing that goes wrong or could go wrong is that we would take something, some combination of x's and y's, and that would somehow make the inside of this logarithm either zero or negative. So we're gonna to try to make sure that that argument, the stuff inside the parentheses is positive. And so in other words, what we want is x squared plus y squared minus one should stay bigger than zero. And so both of these things need to be true in order for us to get a real number out of that. So a function is defined as long as both y is bigger than or equal to zero, and this other thing is true. So this is the main difference for us uh, when we think about a function of two variables. So with a function of one variable, we only had some x thing basically to worry about. So if we wanted to depict the domain, it would just be an interval of real numbers. Not too bad. So now that we're looking at functions of two variables, it's both combinations of x's and y's that result in some input to this function and then we get a number out the other side. Um, so when we try to depict a domain, it's no longer satisfactory to just look at an interval of real numbers. Instead, what we get is something in the plane because a combination of x's and y's means that we're looking at basically two dimensions for consideration. So, uh, right, this is a depiction of this, uh, and I wanna try to do kind of a, almost like a Venn diagram kind of deal. Um, so the claim is that this top part is what we end up with um, when we combine these things. So uh, the end goal, and I'll see if I can add another color to this, is basically, you know, uh, our graph stops here, but um, the final result is anything up here. Uh, outside of that disk, but basically above the x-axis. And so this is a combination of two things. This is, this is the, the first bit, which said, take everything that's outside of that. So x, plus y, x squared plus y squared equals something or other is the equation of a circle in the plane. As my, me as your instructor, I'm not asking you to memorize that. Your, your, uh, your instructor for your class may have a different plan. Um, but y squared plus x squared equals some constant would be the equation of a circle. Greater than some constant would be the stuff outside of the circle. So I'm going to look, look like I'm a second grader drawing a picture of the sun here. But basically, that, that condition for the logarithm gave us everything outside of this disk. The other piece that came up for us here was that uh, we were supposed to look at y greater than or equal to zero. Uh, 
So that y greater than or equal to zero means anything that's at or above the x-axis. So that's gonna be all this stuff, but the y greater than or equal to zero part doesn't take into account this other problem that the logarithm created. So you notice these green lines intentionally kind of go over that inner disk. Well, okay, so in order for both these things to happen, we have to make sure that we're both in the green and in the red, which means that pink kind of outline. Apparently red plus green equals magenta, but I don't know if you can convince anyone that that's, that that's actually true. So this combined, this intersected area is the stuff above the circle, but um, uh, not crossing this horizontal axis. Okay, so I, I, like I often do with these, I'm picking a more complicated example to try out in the video so you get kind of the full picture of what's going on. Okay, uh, so broccoli has been eaten, now it's time for dessert. F of one comma four, as if you watched the previous video, you'll recall that the main thing we have to keep track of is that the order actually does matter here. Um, the first one is X, the second one is Y. These often go in lexicographical order, like they're alphabetical, the first one in the alphabet first and the second one second. And there's no th nothing that requires that that be true, so we just gotta track these things. So uh, there's Y, uh, here is X in there, there's another Y. This is also a one, but it, that was part of the original formula. So this is us plugging in ones for all the X's and fours for all the Y's. Uh, we're going to get two out in front and then a natural log of 16 when we're done. Okay, we've got one for you to try out. So here's our function, s of n comma t. So we're shaking things up a little bit. Our inputs, kind of like that Cobb Douglas one if you watched the previous video, um, our inputs aren't x's and y's because we want to get used to that stuff. So our task here is to compute s of 2 comma 4 and find its domain. So this would be a good time to pause and try it on your own. Okay, I'm gonna assume you gave this a shot and we're gonna see if we can manage this together. So our job is to compute S of two comma four, that's our first task, so let's see if we can accomplish that. So S of, well, let's go back to a bolder color. Go big or go home, right? So S of two comma four would say, uh, the two corresponds to the n, the four corresponds to the t. So I'm gonna go in this formula, replace all of the t stuff with four. Uh, there, were, there was only t stuff on the top, only n stuff on the bottom, n is gonna be two. And you know, that's fine. Uh, if your instructor wants you to simplify, go for it. This looks like uh, three times, and 16 minus four is 12. There's a three on bottom, so we're gonna end up with 12 when we're all done. Second part of this task is to find the domain of S. Well, okay, so I mentioned three things that can go wrong. In the previous problem, we had a radical, so we had to watch out for that, make sure that it stayed non-negative underneath the radical. There are no square roots here, so that's not a problem. The second thing that went wrong in the last example was the logarithm, uh, taking the log of zero or the log of something that's negative, that's also a problem. I don't see any logarithms here, so great, we're two for two so far. The last thing that could go wrong here is that we could divide by zero through some accident, and I think we actually do have to worry about that in this case. So let's, uh, let's try this out with the denominator. So our domain is gonna be everything so that our denominator doesn't make us divide by zero. So the only thing in the denominator here is n plus one. So if we make sure that n plus one isn't zero, we're basically saying n can't be negative one. That's our only restriction. And so depending on your instructor's preferences, you may have to depict this. So let's just give this a shot. Uh, n equals negative one would be our input value for this, our first input for this function. So on the horizontal axis in this graph. So our domain looks like uh, not that. <laughs> so everything else besides that, the stuff that falls on that line. So everything to the left and everything to the right. As long as you don't have uh, an input of n equal to negative one, everything's gonna be hunky-dory. Okay, let's see what else we've got going on. So that's, that's our domain stuff. 
Next, we're gonna to try to tackle some pictorial stuff. So before I leave this image, just to remind ourselves, what the domain is really telling us is essentially, this is the, the flat ground that uh, represents uh, all these different combinations of points that can go into this function. So usually when we think about functions of, of one variable, we think, oh, this horizontal axis is the input stuff, this vertical axis is the output stuff. That's not what's going on here anymore because both of these things are inputs. A point here is just an input to a function. And so the perspective I'm trying, I try to think of this is that this is the ground floor. These are the inputs. Then the height above the ground would be the output of this function. So if you've already used up two dimensions to talk about your inputs, you need a third dimension in order to talk about the outputs. And so we're graphing in three dimensions. Um, this is pretty hard by hand. Uh, again, up to, up to instructor discretion, how much of this happens, whether technology is involved. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I hate to put too fine a point on it, but you have a piece of paper that is more or less a two-dimensional object. So drawing on it a three-dimensional thing takes some kind of tricks of perspective and whatnot. So not, not a straightforward task. So uh, just to reiterate, our inputs are points in, say, the xy plane, and then we often denote that vertical axis as z, the, say, the height above that plane or the height above the ground. So I'm going to use uh, a Wolfram Alpha graph, uh, so credit where credit is due. Um, so this is uh, a three-dimensional plot using Wolfram Alpha, and I, I just want to take a moment to kind of illustrate what's going on here. So we've got uh, let's use a color. We've got our x-axis here that represents diff moving along in this direction. So x equals zero would be across the middle. You'll notice there's kind of a perspective thing going on here. This is sort of at a diagonal. So uh, an x value of zero would go all the way through the middle of this figure, basically to the back wall. So this is the floor of the back wall, if you will. Um, and then similarly, we've got our y values that run along this kind of... Uh, northeast southwest kind of dimension and so zero zero would be right in the middle of this uh, in, in the, the bottom of this plane would be right in the middle of this graph uh, and then one more dimension uh, i'm going to label it z would be this vertical height so zero 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 <laughs> x equals zero y equals zero and a height of zero would basically be the the middle of this graph so that point right in the center and then I'm supposed to imagine that this surface is actually, you know, maybe this is a wavy blanket as people are sort of making the bed or whatever, but um, our different coordinates are actually triples here, basically. They are an X, a Y, and a Z in order to talk about the three dimensions. So for instance, if I'm at this point, this far point way along the edge, um, the X value looks like it goes to negative one at the edge of this graph. So maybe it's a little bit more than negative one there. Um, the y coordinate looks like it's about at negative five. And then, yep, one more. We're going to talk about the height. The height of this box goes up to about one. So that point would be an x, a y, and a z, a triple. Um, a negative one, comma, negative five, comma, one. And so we're going to sort of try to track what these points look like in general. I'm not sure how great our expectations for actually being able to generate graphs like this go. Um, but uh, this is at least an exploration into that 3D element. So oftentimes what we'll do, since we have exactly this problem of, uh, of running into uh, graphing three-dimensional things on two-dimensional objects, and so what we will often do is try to reduce one of these dimensions. Um, one of the ways to do that is by having a level, looking at a level curve, and that means basically picking a fixed height that you want to look at and just saying, okay, what does this graph of XY stuff look like if you take the Z out of the mix? So this maybe feels counterproductive, like, wait, you just added a third dimension and now you're taking it away? Well, we don't always do this, but um, there are some neat applications to this as well. For instance, if this is your, if F of XY is your cost function and you have a budget of C dollars, fixing this dollar value at C and seeing what combination of uh, sales, X's and Y's, would result in, in using your budget exactly correctly. That could be an interesting problem for us. So, uh, right, a level curve um, is going to talk about uh, a fixed output. And just to sort of complete the picture, uh, your instructor may not care about this, um, but we can also talk about a trace 
or a slice. Now I'm hungry because it makes me think about slices of cake. Oh, well, um, at some x value or some y value. So this seems sort of unfair, like, oh, what's so special about this z thing? Why does it? Why is it the only thing that we get to fix at a constant? Well, it's not the only thing. Um, so we can also talk about a, a trace or a slice at a fixed x value. So again, that, that cost analogy might be that instead of having a fixed budget, we're trying to say we have a target production for this x product. And uh, what combination of producing our second product along with uh, cost, what does that graph look like? What does it look like when we have a fixed production level for one and we see what happens when we vary the production in the other thing? How does that affect cost? So that would be a, a, sli a slice, <laughs> a slice, huh. uh, trace or a slice at say x equals some fixed value. Um, y gets the same treatment. So uh, we're focusing on the level curve for this. Um, and I'm gonna scan back to that, that previous picture, that example of a 3D graph that we gave earlier. Um, but if we fix the height at point two, just remember that graph we had only went from about negative one to one for height. So not a lot of uh, Z values to pick from, but this would be a, a graph of the X's and Y's against one another. And so let's go back and, and see how we get these little kind of semicircular things from that picture. So here's our graph. And the thing we're supposed to be looking at is a height of about 0.2. So, you know, roughly there. And I'm drawing this kind of dotted little perimeter because we hopefully have this kind of box that goes through here. Well, at a height below one, what I'm supposed to imagine is that I, I don't get to change how high I am. So if I'm on the side of a mountain, I have to be moving side to side along the edge of the mountain. Um, so what I'm, I'm supposed to see is that if we do that, we end up with these little segments along the graph, and I'm intentionally not drawing the back part of that because it sort of disappears behind the edge of the mountain there. So we've got this kind of fixed height that goes around the edge. And so those little dotted blue lines correspond to the level curve of this function at that height. So it's only the X's and Y's that get to change. Again, the mountain analogy is that we, we say aren't trying to move up or down the, the mountain, we just wanna kinda of go around the edge. So without changing our height of 0.2, then we can see that our level curves look like these kind of little circular pieces that we slice through. Okay, so that's just an illustration of this graph again. Uh, I think the, the ones at the outer edges um, didn't get used there. Anyway, so those are the moving around the kind of rounded uh, edges of that mount. Okay, so there's a preliminary look at uh, what these graphs might look like, and that'll do it for section 7.1. We'll come back in 7.2 and start talking about rates of change, derivatives.